All right, it's 12 o'clock. Welcome back to those of you that joined the earlier session. We have with us Mr. Aaron Guyman, who is a case instructor out of Maryland, who uh, has a lot of experience in the case biotechnology curriculum. Aaron did a spectacular session earlier in the morning, uh, kind of overviewing uh, what biotechnology is, what it means, what it includes, what it doesn't include, and offered some basic tips and best practices that he has found um, effective in his classes. He's here with us again uh, for this session to give a little bit more of an advanced um, description of how he utilizes the case biotechnology curriculum for his students. So Aaron, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as introduced, I'm Aaron Guyman. I've been teaching in 23 years in Maryland. And I've been doing a case biotech thing since it was originated several years back. Uh, I've been doing lead teaching of that course and teaching with my students for a little while now. And so at the earlier session, we discussed some introductions to biotechnology in an agricultural context. Uh, the purpose of this session is to dig deeper. So I'm going to share my screen with you right now. Let you look at the PowerPoint that I've prepared here. All right. And so um, a little review from the previous session. You know, bi biotechnology, I go back and review with my students on kind of a regular basis. Biology is life. Technology are tools to make our life easier. So when we put them together, it basically means we're taking Mother Nature figuring out how she does her stuff, and then using it for our advantage. Um, and uh, I would stress that we need to make sure with our students we're discussing that the simultaneous benefit and detriment of technologies across the board, not just biotech, but all technologies. Um, and that, that is equally here. Uh, I would also go back and um, you know, review a little bit of the, the timeline that we had earlier that as technology advances, we generally see it getting smaller and smaller, more at the microscopic and submicroscopic levels, maybe even at the atomic level as we are now in biotechnology, and that the amount of discovery and advancement is increasing. And so every day something new is happening. And uh, while I was on break, I just read another article of something that we discussed in the last beginner session that is coming to fruition as well. So technological pace is really, really quickening. Okay. In this session, the advanced session, uh, we're gonna focus more on context, uh, context uh, and preparation for careers. Uh, really uh, mastery type learning at this point. Uh, technical skills are gonna be what I'm gonna to touch on a little bit and technical knowledge and I'm going to give you resources that you can use to expand your own knowledge. Um, but really it's difficult at a distance for me to help you with your, with your skills because I, I can't even see you uh, and help, help you and nor, nor do you maybe have access to all the tools at this point. And so we might discuss some of the things that have to be purchased uh, and stuff like that. But ultimately, I want to keep in mind that this session is, is starting to help transition our, our thinking as teachers to the preparation of agricultural scientists that are going to make productivity, efficiency, sustainability, environmentally friendly, environmental friendliness, and food safety all, all go in a positive direction. Okay? The previous session was about society uh, interfacing with science. Uh, this is more about creating people that are going to be workers and they're gonna work in laboratories and, and so forth like that, okay? So that's my mission by uh, 1245. And so first off, two key things I want us, us to keep in mind as we work through some of this. I hope that you're tuning into this session because you have a fairly decent understanding of the central dogma of molecular biology, which is that the pro protein molecules are synthesized, that is created, through a relatively straightforward process where DNA contains the instructions for making protein. Those instructions are transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated, and then from that RNA translation, protein molecules are assembled. Okay, 
that relatively simple process is super complicated, <laughs> um, but that is the central dogma. And so when someone sends DNA as a molecule of life, well, maybe, it's, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I prefer to tell my students that DNA is the library of life. And until someone goes in and selects a book and reads it and does what the book says, DNA is nothing more than a library. You know, a library is, sits empty with no interaction, it does nothing. And so that's what DNA is. And it's not until we add these other components. All right. Now with that also said, there are other organic molecules in the world. Proteins are only one. We have lipids or fats and oils. We have carbohydrates. Uh, we have uh, other nucleic acids that are doing things in the body, but none of them are built from DNA. Rather, DNA makes a protein that will then build those things. So, so proteins are sort of the structural and the worker molecules. Uh, I, I, my father was a construction worker, an excavator, and so I like to talk to my students and say, not only is our proteins the, the things from which we build buildings, but it's also the equipment we use to build them. So the bulldozers that dig the foundation, uh, the loaders and the forklifts that lift the lumber and materials into place, and even the people themselves are the protein molecules assembling the house, uh, and, they're, and they're using uh, a variety of, of supplies to do that, okay? And so let's talk about that. The bovine or the cattle genome is nearly three billion base pairs, similar in size to the human genome, right? That's three billion pairs or six billion individual DNA nucleotides, A's, C's, T's, and G's in nearly every cell of the, of the cattle body. And they then contain the instructions uh, 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 about 20 to 25,000 genes. And each gene then is an instruction for making a protein. And so um, if, we, if we go back to the library analogy, that's a lot of proteins. Uh, why do you need so many proteins? Well, because of number two here, a very vital understanding in biotechnology is molecular shape. Every one of these proteins is slightly different shaped, and because of that difference, they become super specific, and they carry out generally one and only one task. So in the process of building this house, we need 22,000 structural and or machine molecules to, to finish the project. Okay, so some of these genes in an organism are instructions for uh, making a structural protein that will form the studs, the walls, the ceiling, the lights, the electrical wires of this house, while other proteins are actually the carpenters, the roofing technician, the electricians, the plumbers that are installing them. Okay, And so each of those molecules is made individual and is given individual tasks because of its shape. So those two pieces underpin a lot of what happens in biotechnology. Okay, and so as an advanced biotech, I wanna focus on, as the, the, the title slide said, how some of this stuff is done. And I can't get into the deep details. If you wanna do that, you're gonna to need to come take a very deep course with me or someone else, and it's gonna take you quite a while. And you can talk with Darla Romberger about this. This is a two week course from the case level. Iowa State teaches some of these courses to undergrads as well as to other teachers, and none of them are short. A lot of this takes time. So what I've given you on these slides is the topics and some links to what I consider to be reputable resources to help teach yourself about these. In addition to the fact that you can probably, and I didn't put this in writing, but you can probably request a teacher's copy of some biotechnology textbooks for review at no cost to yourself and use those as some resources if, if you so wish. Um, or if you have trouble sleeping, order one of those textbooks and tackle it before you go to bed because sometimes they're not as engaging. So the videos tend to be a little bit better and more appealing. Okay, so how do we just manipulate genes, right? That's the big thing in biotech today is genetic manipulation. When I, I talked earlier that biotechnology has gotten smaller and smaller and that's because we're at the molecular level now. We're messing with the, GNA, the DNA molecule or the RNA molecules quite a bit. We're even changing the way proteins are designed. So one of the techniques is uh, recombinant DNA technology and that's where we take restriction enzymes 
which are immune molecules. They're proteins, but they are immune molecules from bacteria that are Mother Nature's way of chopping up the DNA of an invading virus. And we've learned how to use those to actually snip out a gene from one organism and then snip out, uh, snip an opening into the target organism's DNA with the same enzymes. We stick it in there, it ligates, that means it sticks, it glues itself in. And now we have this gene of interest, this novel gene placed into a, a new organism. All right, and so both of these videos kind of demonstrate how that happens. That's called recombinant DNA technology. That's actually kind of old and a little sluggish in today's day and age. Um, there's also this idea of agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is a plant disease bacteria. It actually is found on crown gall. If you go out into the woods and you see this tumor growing on a tree, usually up in the air, I see it a lot on cherry trees around my area. That is a technically a sort of a plant cancer, but we've learned that this agrobacterium tumefaciens actually causes cancer by inserting its own DNA into other plant tissue. Essentially, it genetically modifies its target. So we took out the tumor gene. We took out the gene that the plant sticks into its target and replaced it with something that we want, like say, frost resistance in strawberries. And so the agrobacterium, thinking it's creating a tumor, is actually creating a, a plant that has a modification that we want on purpose. All right, that, that's um, somewhat new. And a little bit later in the PowerPoint, I'm gonna show you a resource, an online simulation where students actually use agrobacterium to modify plants. It's a nice simulation, it's free of charge. And then here's another way that we use a biological tool, a mother nature tool directly to mess with DNA, and that's called CRISPR, which you may have heard of uh, a year or two ago. Some a Chinese biologist manipulated some embryos to try and, and confer uh, resistance to HIV, and that's been very ugly uh, if you've been watching some of that because messing with human humans is, is generally not considered, especially human embryos is no-no in the world. But then what I was reading also here is that they have used CRISPR to modify a adult woman in the United States South to try and remedy remedy her sickle cell anemia. And one year after the treatment, she is showing great improvement and it has not influenced her life nearly as negatively as it had before. Uh, incidentally, sickle cell anemia is caused by a protein that is wrongly shaped. So if we go back to this idea of DNA making proteins, something is messed up in the DNA that causes her protein to be malformed. And so CRISPR was used to actually take and correct the DNA problem, thus resulting in the formation of the proper protein shape. So CRISPR clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats is another immune system for bacteria where they actually take the DNA of a invading virus, chop it up and stick it into their own DNA, thus giving them the recognition capability of recognizing an, an invader in the future and messing it up and dealing with it. So it does not infect them. Scientists have then taken the ability of them to incorporate the viral DNA into their bacterial genome uh, they've used that exact same technique, and instead of them incorporating viral DNA, scientists have taught the CRISPR molecule to take our specific gene of interest, or our target gene, and stick it in. All right, and so CRISPR takes and edits its own GM, genome as a way of recognizing invaders. We just told it to take and stick in the gene that we wanted to stick in. And so, or maybe not even the gene, but to edit the gene. And so in this case of sickle cell anemia, it is replacing um, one 
amino acid in the malformed molecule with the correct amino acid. And so CRISPR has taught the human, um, has actually edited this lady's DNA with the correct protein instructions. So it's not even entering a whole gene, it actually corrected one codon. So it put the right amino acid in. All right, a codon is the sequence of three uh, nucleotide bases and, and a codon is the instruction for which amino acid will be will be placed at a specific location in a protein sequence. And so that's pretty cool because CRISPR now doesn't even edit whole genes. It actually allows us to go into. So if, if, if we go back to the original analogy I gave that DNA is a library and that each gene is a book, CRISPR is actually replacing words on a specific page within a book. So that's, in my opinion, really, really interesting. And that's where I talk about we go from the macroscopic to the molecular level. We're actually changing the molecule. Each amino acid is its own molecule. We're actually manipulating at the molecular level now. So those are some biological tools. We can also manipulate genes or change genes with mechanical and chemical tools. And these are comparatively uh, more vulgar or more crude. In many cases, these are older in technology because um, we didn't, we didn't just, we didn't know how to do this, and it was sort of like, let's try anything. And so, one of the first things they did was particle bombardment, aka a gene gun. They took heavy, heavy elements like gold and platinum, uh, elements that were very large and have large valences on the outside, and particles would stick to them. And so, what they would do is they would take a gene that they had chopped out of another organism, and it would it would want to stick to this gold particle, and they would literally just take and shoot it at a mass of cells, hoping that that gold atom or that cluster of gold atoms, which were holding on to a, a gene of interest, would hit the DNA in just the right place to cause that gene to stick. So think about this. You want to paint the Mona Lisa, but you want to give her a smile instead of that little flat smirk that she has, right? So what you do is you take a shotgun shell and you open it up and you put the correct paint on one pellet in that shell. You put it back in the shell. You reload the shell into your shotgun. You aim it at the Mona Lisa and you have your fingers crossed that that pellet will hit the Mona Lisa in the mouth, causing the corners of her mouth to tweak up and give her a smile instead of the little flat smirk that she has. That's particle bombardment. Not super precise. Uh, it's really potluck. And so what you're doing is you're doing a lot of particle bombardment, hoping that you get the right things to stick in the right spots and you get a couple atoms or excuse me, a couple molecules that are modified and then work forward from there. Uh, so that's why I mean it's kind of crude and vulgar. It's, it's, it's really, really medieval. Uh, they have another technique. It's mechanical, which is electroporation. We simply expose cells to electrical shock or electrical current, it causes their cell membranes to become more permeable and DNA that we have in solution with the cells may float into the cell itself and work its way into the nucleus and stick alongside the other DNA. And as a result, it's kind of a hitchhiker riding the bus and anytime the DNA gets to doing its thing, we hope that this gene will be um, effected as well and will do its thing. All right. Again, it's like you just snuck into the library and put another book on the shelf, hoping that someone comes along and reads the book that you stuck in there. So it's not quite as, as, as neat. Heat shock and cold shock are similar as well. We're just simply stressing the, the, the cell, causing the membrane to become more permeable and suck up new DNA. Now, some of these, the electroporation, heat shock, and cold shock, and chemical shock actually work more efficiently in prokaryotes. That's, that's usually bacteria because they have a thing called a plasmid. And plasmids are non-nuclear um, non DNA, even though pro prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. They're not chromosomal. Uh, they're independent. And actually, plasmids are sort of like sexual reproduction for bacteria. They actually trade them back and forth between themselves. And in doing so, they confer genetic variation. And so if we take and genetically modify a plasmid, we can usually get a bacterial cell to suck it up through one of these three lower mechanical methods. And then that bacteria then starts actually using that plasmid to do what we want it to do. 
this is kind of how insulin was developed. Insulin was one of the very first human pharmaceuticals developed with genetic manipulation, uh, recombinant DNA technology. And what we did is it took a, a plasmid that had the human insulin gene attached to it. We stuck it with a whole bunch of bacteria. We shocked them to make them permeable, to make their cell membrane permeable. They sucked up the plasmid, and before you knew it, they're making insulin for us. Okay? And so... Those are mechanical tools that we manipulate genes, okay? All right, so here's some, some class stuff. Uh, PBS.org has got this website that is free of charge, put out by WGBH in Boston. Um, it requires Flash Player, which is a challenge because I know Flash Player, I think is starting, it might be disabled on Chrome platforms in the near future. But here is that website and it allows you to engineer a cop. And it walks through with the students and explains what's happening and they're gonna genetically engineer using agrobacterium tumefaciens that was discussed earlier. Uh, they're gonna genetically engineer a, a, a tomato plant to be resistant. I think in this case, it's a mosaic virus. And it's a, a really cool one. We actually use this same one in our case curriculum. So that's a good classroom way that you can help kids learn about a biological technique for genetic manipulation. There's that link. Okay. Um, this PowerPoint, parts of this PowerPoint are free of charge from BioRad. This p plasmid is actually proprietary. It's owned by a biomedical company. They, they actually contained a, a gene um, from a jellyfish. Um, Aquaria vittori has a gene which causes it to produce a green fluorescent protein. It fluoresces especially well under um, infrared A type of light. And so they made this plasmid for students to use to simulate the genetic transformation process in the classroom, which allows them to see it in action. Um, because GFP green fluorescent protein is visual, kids can see their success. Uh, we don't often need to do something visual in agricultural products. It's usually some other type of protein that is not visual. So this lab is frequently used because it's an easy visual way for kids to see their product. We don't have to go back and do any other scientific tests to see if it's producing another non-visual protein. Okay. Oops. All right. And so what I wanted to go for with this one now too is to give you more technical knowledge. So if we do transform a cell to produce a protein that we want, we can't just transform it for that protein on its own because um, we can't control it. So once we sometimes will start to actually do genetic modification with regulatory functions and, 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 and things like this that allow us to turn the genes on and off. And so I wanted to just share this with you. So say we want to transform a cell. Transform means to make its DNA different. We're going to add in the DNA. We're going to transform it by adding this novel gene, the green fluorescent protein gene. We're also going to take and make sure that we can kill cells that are not transformed. So this yellow strip called BLA is called beta lactamase. It's a protein that deactivates ampicillin. So if I'm a scientist in a laboratory, I have millions of bacteria growing on a Petri dish. I expose them to modified plasmids, this p -glow thing here, but not all of them are actually going to change. Some of them are stubborn and we need to get rid of them because we don't want them consuming nutrients if we are trying to grow a new, a new bacteria. And so we kill them with ampicillin. We make sure that the strain of bacteria we're using is susceptible to the ampicillin in this case. But we don't want to kill our transformed bacteria. So in addition to putting this p plasmid or this green fluorescent gene on the plasmid, we also put a resistance gene on that allows us to select, select for uh, and keep the transformed cells and eliminate the non-transformed cells. So scientists have to make sure that they can isolate. And in the simulation back here, you're gonna see that they um, talk about Roundup resistance. 
In the PBS simulation for transforming the tomato plant, they make the tomato plant Roundup resistant or glyphosate resistant, so they can use the pesticide glyphosate to kill non-transformed cells and thereby get a completely transformed organism. Wonderful. So well, now we have them growing, but do we want these cells producing the protein nonstop? For example, do you want your stomach cells producing lactase, the enzyme that breaks down lactose, milk sugar, all the time? And the answer is no, that's wasteful. Mother Nature does not need to produce lactase if you haven't eaten a dairy product. So we, Mother Nature has actually programmed our stomach cells to turn off lactase until it detects lactose in our stomach. It turns it on, it digests our milk, and then it stops making lactase. And as a result, we're not wasting energy and resources on something that's needed. So that is called gene regulation, when we can turn a gene on and off as needed. Scientists need to do that also, right? They do not want genes on all the time because they use energy, they use resources, it's wasteful. So just like Mother Nature creates an, uh, an operon protein, we have done the same thing and we have found those and created those to turn genes on and off. And so in this case, this Arabinose C is a protein that will block. It actually, when it's made, it actually sits right here on top of the GFP gene. It's like a fat kid sitting on top of the seesaw and not getting off and no one else can use a seesaw then. And until that kid gets off the seesaw, the seesaw is out of, out of use. And so that's what this era C is. It's a, it's a protein that inhibits or blocks GFP and will not get off of GFP until we add in an environmental key or another molecule. In this case, it's the sugar arabinose. Arabinose entices the fat kid or the blocking protein to get off of the gene. When it's off, the gene is exposed, and the cell will actually start doing, making the, the protein, green fluorescent protein, that is instructed by the, the gene. Well, how you, you're asking me, well, how, how then? How does this happen? All right, well, the, 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 the blocking protein has a very, very specific shape that is only specific to the gene GFP. Arabinose has a very specific shape, and on the blocker protein is a keyhole that arabinose fits into. And when arabinose gets into that keyhole, it causes the shape of the blocking protein to change, and it lets go of the GFP gene, thereby exposing it and allowing it to be um, turned on and used by the cell. So remember at the beginning of this thing where I talked about molecular shape is super important? Perfect example right here of how three molecules, um, uh, excuse me, two molecules are designed by scientists and their molecular shape is used to turn the gene on and off. So that's called gene regulation. And that's something that we talk about a lot in biotech as well because we need to turn off and turn on our, our, our organisms so that they don't cause trouble, okay? All right, so, so there's some ideas here that these are links to several different companies and they sell kits where you can do this same lab. Right here, the BioRad kit up front at the top is the one that we use in Case Biotech. It's also made for AP biology courses and some of your students may already be doing this lab as part of their AP curriculum. Oops, excuse me, sorry. The Edvotech one here is the same lab, just a different company selling it. Edvotech is another biotechnology educational supply company. All right, and this third one here, PH School, this actually, is a virtual lab from Pearson that does what those other labs do and it walks the kids through, talks about plasmids and how they are used in biotech uh, and it gets actually into the transformation experiment. And so this is totally a virtual one. Uh, and to my knowledge, it's free. I accessed it for free. I don't think you have to have a Pearson uh, subscription or anything like that. 
as, as well. And so it actually gets into some more biotech topics here as well, if you wish. All right. So this, this is a, a, a low cost option, or this might be a distance ed option. We don't know what August and September is going to bring. So that could be a way to help your kids. Some YouTubes here and a Khan Academy video that talk about gene regulation. So they discuss how we can turn genes on and off. Question. Wonderful. Let's take a look. Thought about doing micro labs in the fall with COVID. Any changes or alterations you can recommend beyond the normal precautions? Well, I'll be honest with you here. Um, in the case curriculum, we're using labs that are ident actually identified uh, for human diseases. And because we're agricultural, we just change some words in the lab procedures. So we're not testing for HIV. We might be testing for West Nile virus in horses or we might be doing DNA testing for susceptibility to say a sickle cell anemia. We just say, nope, we're testing for scrapies susceptibility in sheep. But none of the labs are using anything which presents a danger to human health in a public school setting. So uh, if you're gonna be doing some of these micro labs, I would look at them and see how you can sort of fake the kids. You're still teaching them the same science, the same technical skills and stuff, but you're not exposing them to potential risks. Does that make sense, Sarah? Um, I would also, if you're gonna do COVID because it's current and relevant, um, we would talk also here, what I'm gonna expose or get onto here a little bit later is just the disease testing. Okay, and how the, the testing and the vaccine stuff works. And so I'm gonna get into that here in a few minutes. So we might revisit COVID. Okay. Another cool topic that works really well in ag science is marker assisted selection, which is taking a sample of animal or plant DNA and testing it to look for genes, genes that we want or genes that we don't want. Okay, and so uh, in, the, in the dairy industry, this is actually taking the reproductive cycle and taking the life of a typical dairy sire from six to eight years down to like three or four years. The dairy industry's genetic improvement is expanding three to four times faster than it was 20 years ago when I was in college. Okay, yeah, I understand, Sarah. Yeah, we really, really, uh, um, I would also, uh, Sarah said, uh, asked a question about the sensitivity to the public right now of infectious disease. Yeah, there is a, actually the, 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 the bacterium that we use, H, uh, E. coli HB 101, is one of the most benign, least dangerous E. coli versions out there. It's used by scientists so often because it is so, actually it's like, um, the Barney of E. coli, it has no danger to humans at all and is easily controlled with various simple medications. So, all right, moving back forward, marker assisted selection. So we take a blood sample, we pull the DNA out of it. We treat the DNA with uh, some restriction enzymes, a concoction identified by agricultural scientists to single out the genes of interest. We then put the DNA on an electrophoresis gel and we perform a a DNA fingerprint, just like criminal scientists do to look for crimin criminals at scenes of crimes. But instead of looking for a criminal, we're actually looking for a special gene of interest. And so marker-assisted selection allows us to pick a sire or dam within a couple of days after birth and determine if they have the genes that we want or we don't want. And so we can make keep or call decisions really early in life. Uh, this Biotech Iowa State publication uh, kind of gets into that and talks about how that is used in uh, agriculture and agricultural animals. Uh, and like I said, um, we can also then use this in cultured meristematic tissues of plants. So if we try and genetically modify a plant and we want to make sure it has the gene that we want, we can wait till it grows for a couple of weeks, take a very small sample of it and run the, run the process and see if it got the gene that we want. And we can determine if our tissue cultures in the lab need to be kept and continue to grow or if we need to terminate them because they're not successful. Uh, Sarah, I'm not 100% what A1 and A2 is uh, identification, but if it's 
I, I'm going to go to Las Vegas and say with 90% confidence that yes, marker assisted selection is when they're testing uh, dairy cattle DNA to determine if it's got disease that are genes that are desirable and helps us determine if the cows and the bulls are keeper cull. Okay. Uh, nearly every bull that goes into a bull stud nowadays for the various genetic improvement companies is going to have this done to them within days of birth. So, so marker assisted selection is really pretty cool. Semen sexing has revolutionized the dairy industry. There's several different ways, and I've given you some links here. But essentially, what it's allowing us to do with 95 plus percent accuracy is to, to, to separate semen into male and female. And of course, in the dairy industry, you want females. And so, what they'll do is take a superior bull, sort the semen, and sell. 95% guaranteed female semen, and so a dairy farmer buys semen from this superior bull, and now he, gets 90, he or she gets 95% of the daughters that have this superior bull, and they're daughters, because you know, dairy bull calves are not very valuable. All right. Moreover, if I'm a genetic improvement company, I'm going to also buy uh, uh, ova flushes from superior cows in the dairy industry, and I'm going to treat them with sex semen and now I'm going to be selling embryos for a very nice uh, amount of money um, and, and allow that superior. So, so embryo transfer technology and in vitro fertilization technologies combined with semen sexing are leading to dairy advancement at astronomical rates. My students and I take a field trip to Transova Genetics here in Maryland uh, and, and they're sending out containers of 95% guaranteed female embryos to other countries of the world for millions of dollars. It's pretty cool. And, and our state FFA executive here in Maryland, her family has sold lots and lots of dairy embryos out of that, out of that location um, because of this technology. How do they do this, you're asking? Well, in some cases, they stain the semen. Male semen or X semen, uh, excuse me, Y chromosome semen, male semen will have one color and female will be another. A laser detects them and reads them. And as the single stream of sperm cells flow through, they are using a magnetic field which interacts with this, the stain color. And that stain is positive and uh, is negative for male sperm and pulls them into one receptacle and it is negative for female sperm. And so they're sorting it using magnetic field and coloring techniques. There's also been molecular weight. For those of you that are familiar, Y chromosome is smaller than X. So male sperm is slightly lighter in weight. And so they're sorting sperm using that, but it's not as foolproof as this one. This, this photo detection method is much more accurate. Uh, Jess Schaefer, this is located just outside of Hagerstown, Maryland. It's called Transova Genetics. They're actually nationwide. They do a lot of dairy and a little bit of beef over there. Uh, you can look up Transova, one word, on the internet and find their website and get their contacts. And they're usually pretty good about student tours. They usually give tours of about an hour or so, depending on which day of the week it is and what they're doing for their clients. They're not the only company that does this. Uh, but as I said, my state FFA executive, one of her relatives is also in there in an administrative level. So we sort of had an in inside line. <laughs> And finally, they're also using coagulants as well um, because of male sperm and female sperm having slightly different chemical properties. They have learned how to put a coagulant in there, which causes all the male sperm uh, and female sperm to separate, much like uh, happens when you're making cheese with curds and whey, and then they can scoop out one and use it or get rid of it as necessary. So. Disease testing and treatment. So this is what we are talked about a little bit earlier regarding COVID. And Jim uh, Kaltenbach and I, uh, he's my teaching partner for CASE. We were actually talking about this during the early phases and the testing. And so ELISA is one of the most common infectious disease testing. Uh, it works by identifying the antigens. So what's probably happening in some of our uh, COVID testing uh, practices is they're trying to take and make molecules. Again, remember molecular shape. The COVID-19 virus has probably got 
somewhere on it a very unique shape that scientists are trying to find. And once they find that shape, they are able to take and develop antibodies for it because antibodies are very, very specific in molecular shape. And if they can do that, they can create an ELISA test that will look for it. So here's a YouTube link that tells you how ELISA tests work and how they're created, All right? We can also do a DNA test using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. That's the same thing that 23andMe and Ancestry.com do to our saliva when we send it in. They're replicating specific genes. And so if we can find a piece of the COVID-19 viral DNA or RNA that is unique, we can take a human blood sample, run it through a PCR machine and try and replicate that specific segment of DNA that is unique to COVID-19. And if it replicates, it means we have the virus in our system or we have remnants of the virus in our system, which tells us that we are infected or we are post-infection. We do this a lot with a lot of other diseases out there in the world as well. What that also means then is we can actually tailor our therapy specifically. And in human breast cancer, they actually have three karyotypes for a specific gene in human breast cancer. And they will test you for which gene you have if you do have breast cancer to tailor your therapy for that. And a teaching friend of mine in Washington State had a rare type. And because of them tailoring her therapy because of genetic testing, she has been um, cancer free for now over a decade. And she was diagnosed at 26 years of age. We can do the same thing for animals in certain cases. So, so here's some other uh, things that you can look at. There's an Ag in the Classroom lesson that you might want to incorporate. Ag in the Classroom is generally elementary and middle school, but I'm sure you can spruce it up. Uh, and there's some BioRad kits here and stuff as well that will help you work with disease testing. BioRad makes some AP Bio ELISA kits that we use with um, our case curricula as well that you might consider taking it and looking into, okay? But they require the purchase of some other specialized tools. So these kits may themselves be cheap, uh, but some of the tools that you might not have on hand might run up the price there. So the same two websites as earlier, they give you some background. They both come from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and have some cool animations and stuff. There's my email if you wish. I talked now up to two minutes before the deadline, but I'm willing to open up the floor for any questions, video questions, or questions on the question and answer um, bubble and so forth. I know that was a lot, and that was a shotgun there as well. I just took a shotgun shell, coated it with a lot of information, and shot it at your brain. Um, but I'm here anytime you need me via email to help you if you wish. Thank you very much, Aaron, for both sessions. Um, we do have a couple minutes here. So if anybody would like to unmute and ask Aaron a question or make a comment um, verbally, please uh, use the raise hand icon to do so and um, I can unmute you. Again, you I'm can also, also, go ahead. I'm also willing to stay on after hours if you can, if there's a little time. And for people that want to stay afterwards, I'm not sure what time you illegally have to end the session with the Zoom platform. Uh, but I can stay here till like one o'clock if people still want to talk face to face or whatever. Because these are really big topics and are pretty deep. And I know some people may have questions that they don't want to ask in front of the whole group and, and they don't want to um, take away from other folks' time. Okay. Well, as Aaron said, he's willing to hang on here for another 15 minutes or so. Um, we are under a minute from our allotted time on the schedule. Thank you all for joining and thank you, Aaron, for both sessions you did. You did a wonderful job today. Um, at this time, if there are no other questions, you may hop off, take a quick break before uh, today's uh, conference day wraps up officially. Um, thanks again.